so, there's no. Okay. Yeah, if, if there's no <clears throat> further question, then, then I'm done with my quick introduction and we can go to the main subject of the day. I'll stop sharing. And give the floor to Brian. Okay, great. Um, let me do some sharing here. Now you should have sharing rights, Brian. Yes, I have not super familiar with um, WebEx, but I think I've got it figured out here. You should be seeing a, a title slide, Digital Twins Definition Language. Yep. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah, so let's do some introductions first. So uh, I'm Brian Crawford. Um, I'm an architect um, in the Azure IoT team at Microsoft. And um, one of the things that I've been working on is the Digital Twins definition language that we're going to talk about here. And uh, I've been doing that work um, with others on the team. Um, uh, Elio's joined us um, for that. And then um, uh, we've also got Benjamin from the Azure IoT team as well. And I'll let them do some introductions. So Elio, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Elio Damaggio, and uh, uh, I work in the Azure IoT team together with Brian. And I'm Benjamin yeah. Kabe. I work in the Azure IoT team, looking after all things uh, developers. And um, in, in a previous life, I was like doing lots, lots of open source. Some of you might uh, know me from my days at the Eclipse Foundation and uh, the doing a lot of MQTT, like with M2M and all that stuff. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the Digital Twins definition language. I think um, we had heard uh, that you you had come across the Digital Twins definition language and wanted to learn more about it. And so we put together some slides here to talk about that. Uh, did someone have a question or comment? No, okay. Um, so we'll go through, you know, I've got some slides here, but um, also, we just wanted to also say that this, uh, you know, we want to have an open discussion here. Um, and so feel free to, uh, you know, ask questions as we go. Uh, we do have some time at the end for uh, more, more discussion if we don't have it during the, during the presentation. All right. So just to set us up here, uh, we've, this is our, the agenda we've put together, but if you have specific areas or specific questions, we can certainly, um, you know, not don't have to strictly follow this agenda. This is just what we put together um, to try to try uh, introduce DTDL and and talk about some of our experience and experiences and things. So we'll start with a brief introduction of DTDL. Um, we had heard that some of you have have looked at it a little bit, but we'll still just to get everyone on the same page, do a brief introduction of that. Um, and then we'll we've got um, some information to share on why DTDL. Um, so we've got a, a kind of a why slide about that. And then we want to share some of our experiences with um, the technologies that we've used to develop DTL and why we made some of the choices we made. And then we wanted to get into um, areas for collaboration and interoperability um, because we recognize that um, DTL is one of many modeling languages that are out there. And at least what we see from our customers is that they use a, a wide variety of modeling languages. And so we're very interested in how we collaborate and inter interoperate with uh, those things that already exist and that customers and other people are using. And then we've got some time uh, if we need it for questions and discussion at the end. So, so to start us off, um, this first slide is kind of a terminology slide um, before we jump into talking about the DTDL um, specifically. Just to sort of give, give uh, some definitions for the terms that we're using. So we're, you'll hear us talk about digital twins a lot. Um, and what that means to us is a variety of things. Um, so digital twins can be physical devices. So actual IoT devices that are deployed in a physical environment. We will call that a digital twin. Um, sometimes we'll call that a device digital twin if we're trying to be specific. Um, we will have digital twins that represent physical entities like buildings or streetlights or storage tanks, those kinds of things. Um, and, and so, you know, those aren't 
those aren't devices. They may not directly have uh, be met directly measuring their environment, for example, but they may have information that is collected from physical devices that that um, represent what's going on in the environment. Um, then we also have this idea of logical entities, which we also which we also call digital twins. Um, and these can be things like time zones, manufacturers, et cetera. So for example, um, we've been working with one customer who who wants to organize some of their physical entities like buildings and things by time zone. And so they will create a digital twin that represents that time zone that they can then use to collect up um, uh, a set of physical entities or physical devices underneath. So we have those as digital twins. And then um, this last bullet, this or this last bullet in the section, semantics is not a digital twin, but it's this idea of um, across, the, across digital twins, we want to be able to attach um, not only direct descriptions of what those digital twins can do, but their semantics as well. So for example, understanding that an element in a digital twin is a measurement as opposed to a state is, is important to us. And another thing that's important to us is, is not only that um, that element is maybe a number, but that it's actually a temperature and that that temperature is measured in degrees Celsius, for example. And so you'll hear us later talk about um, semantics and semantic types. Uh, and that's kind of an example of what those are. And then lastly, um, we also look at collecting these sets of digital twins or systems of digital twins together where um, customers can create, you know, full buildings, for example, made up of these digital twins that all interrelate together. And so we'll call this either a graph or a system of digital twins or a set of digital twins, those kinds of things. So I'll pause here if there's any questions on any of the terminology here. Yeah, a quick question. Uh, in terms of physical devices, uh, that's the standard definition, I mean, uh, basic of digital twin. I presume it contains the, the last known state and reading and whatever data from the device, right? In yeah, so you'll see when I get into a little bit of the, the modeling part of digital twins, it, uh, you can actually go ahead and model exactly that kind of information. So if you have last state information, that can certainly be represented. And also just to make sure a digital twin, by definition, lives in the cloud. It's some sort of virtual replica of whatever thing it stands for, right? So uh, it certainly does, it certainly, living in the cloud is certainly one place that it lives, but we've also started to see that digital twins may live elsewhere. So they may live um, in uh, more local networks, like on an edge device, for example, that um, is more local to, you know, a set of, of physical things like physical devices or, or physical entities. For example, you might have a factory and you may have uh, an edge device that's local to the factory and that may have some representation of the elements in the factory that, you know, as digital twins. Okay, thanks. Uh, quick question on the systems of digital twins. Is there a concept of historical context? So like if a, uh, you know, component is swapped out or the, some logical entity changes, can they be represented in sort of a time series way? Um, or is that a, a, a effectively a new system? or a snapshot of the system? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, at least what we represent um, currently in the, from the modeling space, we don't um, directly address the historical, um, I guess the historical nature of the data. Wh where we represent that, at least for the, for the service offerings that Microsoft provides, um, we represent that through you know, a time series database, for example, um, where you can collect up that, that time series data. And the model can then be, and then you could have, for example, um, in in that time associated with that time series, a set of the model definitions that match, you know, each of each of the time frames that they apply to. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm going to go on here, um, jump in a little bit into actually what is the digital twins definition language, because that's I think primarily what we're here to talk about. So. Um, to begin with, our, our intention here is that the Digital Twins Definition Language, or DTDL, is an open source modeling language for describing digital twins, um, the list we had on the previous slide. So IoT devices, for example, um, digital twins, as well as the system of digital twins. And so the, the language tries to include, uh, intends to include enough um, 
enough expressivity to be able to express those different things. Uh, and we'll get into some more detailed examples on the next couple of slides so you can actually see what it looks like. Um, and one of the big reasons why we um, why we wanted to introduce modeling um, and then you know and through DHDL in our case is to enable this contract um, between the uh, specification and the consumption. So what we were seeing before this is that in in many cases um, devices and you know IoT devices and IoT solutions would be very tightly coupled together. Um, because there was no contract, no no formal contract, the solution had to be written to to specific devices and understand the specific um, the specific um, interface for the, for each of those devices. What we're enabling here is this is this ability to specify a contract um, in you know in a language agnostic way that a uh, a an IoT developer or a digital twin developer could produce. And then separately, a solution uh, builder could consume, um, and that contract is then the, the common way they exchange how, you know, how they how each side works. Um, the other thing, an, another thing we get out of uh, modeling as well is uh, the ability to have contract enforcement and model driven clients. So with that contract, we can now uh, entertain the idea of you know, having enforcement. So if, if a digital twin says it has a particular property or state that could be enforced at the appropriate layer. Um, and then you can also start to build model driven clients where a client no longer has to say, you know, it works with device X, Y, Z. Instead, it can uh, consume the model and understand that and, pr and provide, uh, you know, appropriate UI or whatever for you know, each of the devices that it chooses to to uh, use. And then more specifically, um, DTDL uh, is, is really a meta model. So we call it the digital twins definition language. But what it really is under the covers is a set of RDF classes and chapter constraints that describe the meta model, um, which then, uh, you know, in turn describes what you can actually express in a DTDL model. So uh, a DTL model, we use JSON LD, which we'll get into a little bit in a couple of slides as well. Um, we use JSON LD as the, as the main language for expressing uh, DTDL models. And um, if you're familiar with that, that's really just a set of RDF triples. And in our case, those are RDF triples that conform to our meta model. So although we use the word language here, it's really um, you know, a set of classes and shackle constraints that describe this under the covers. And our intention here with this is to be programming language agnostic. And um, we chose JSON LD uh, because we wanted this to be um, developer friendly and applicable to a broad set of developers as possible. So I'll pause here again and see if there are any questions on this slide. So JSON LD 1.0 or 1.1? Uh, we are 1.1 right now. Um, I don't think so. I think it's 1.0. So at, uh, maybe you have updated the spec, but when I checked that, then there was the 1.0 used. Yeah, I'll have to go check, I guess. I thought that we had moved up to 1.1 in, um, in our most recent parser that we've implemented, which is, which, which is the library that um, uh, we use to actually understand models. That's the intention. If it's not there, we're not there yet. Okay, so I'll move on to uh, an example here of DTDL, just so you can kind of get a sense of what it looks like. So it is uh, JSON, like I said, so and then specifically JSON LD. And um, this, this example model here is expressing an interface, which is really the top level element that we use in DTDL to, to um, describe what a digital twin looks like. So interface is, is describing the uh, interface that the digital twin exposes. And then in that interface, you can, you can express different things. This example shows um, that this particular digital twin has a property with the name name 
and uh, and, a, and its data type is string. It has telemetry that it sends uh, that's temperature called temperature, and its scheme is double. And then it has a command that is called update uh, that doesn't take any um, arguments and doesn't return any response. So it's just a simple example here. And then just to expand on that, and I've got a picture of this as well. Um, so uh, these are these are all of the top level concepts that you'll see in DTDL. So the interface is the is the is the very top level concept that um, you use to describe the functionality of a digital twin, and then an interface really then describes the property telemetry command, which we just saw in the previous slide in the example. Um, and in addition, it can describe components, which is a way of um, contain a way of uh, expressing containment to other interfaces. Um, it could also contain a relationship, which is a way of um, expressing a reference to another digital twin. And then uh, each of these um, property telemetry command component and relationship have a schema or a data type. And we support primitive data types, which you saw in the previous example as well as a set of complex schema types, arrays, enums, objects, and maps. Um, we also support interface inheritance and uh, for, you know, for special, specializing um, your digital twin interfaces. And then lastly, this idea, there's this idea of semantic type, which I briefly mentioned before, but this is a way to add additional semantics um, onto those properties, telemetry commands, for example. Um, where you could say not only is the telemetry, you know, a uh, uh, named temperature and its data type is double, but that it is also measuring temperature and that the temperature units are in degrees Celsius. And you could even get more specific with semantic types. You could say this not only is this measuring a temperature, but maybe this is measuring, you know, outside air temperature or body temperature, um, different types of temperature as well. Um, and all of that is all of that's there to provide um, that semantic information. For primarily for solutions that are built on top of this, and for machines to be able to reason about this data. A uh, quick question on, on, on that. Yeah. Uh, are those variable in the sense? Can you add an arbitrary number of relevant uh, annotations to a particular point, or are they limited for for a digital twin of a particular type? You can only have certain kinds of annotations. Yeah, so um, I think if I understand the question right, um, you're asking, uh, are there, is it sort of unlimited that you, where you can add these? I don't have a, I don't actually have a good example on this slide. But the way we express this is you add, just add more types here. You got create an array of types. And so from that perspective, the array can contain as many different semantic types as you okay. want it to contain. Um, we do currently in the DTDL v2. If you went, if you went and looked at the the language document, um, it does have a list of semantic types that we consider built-in semantic types that are uh, a set of common um, measurements, uh, measurement types. So temperature, humidity, etc., velocity, a whole bunch of types there, along with their units. And um, what we do. And what we've done right now, and this is where it sort of differs between you know, the language definition and implementation, is that the current implementation has some limitations just because of where the implementation is at. But the intention here with the language is to be able to support semantic types across um, property telemetry command um, and even properties in relationships at some point. And another quick follow-up. Uh, do you have a vocabulary of those uh, semantic annotations? Uh, I'm referring to something like Haystack has a large vocabulary of those, and IoT schema is trying to also standardize them. So do you have your own or do you use one of those? So right now we have our own that we've created that um, that you can easily use from DTDL. But one of the places we actually want to um, talk about um, you know collaboration is how can we start to bring in some of those other um, uh, definitions. One now I'm trying to remember the name. There's another one. I think it was QU type or something like that, um, where there is a set of like you're saying. There's a there's a vocabulary of those uh, stand you know 
based on standards, a set of, of uh, useful semantic, what well, well, we call semantic types, but a useful of these, yeah. useful set of these, you know, measurement types or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And this here is just a diagram really of what I show, what I, you know, what we have in text on the other slide there. Um, this is not a complete, you know, this is not a complete set, a uh, complete class diagram, but this is the, the uh, main concepts here. Um, I wanted it to be able to fit nicely on the slide um, and not have, a, not have everything in here. But the, the language document that I think you've probably seen or some of you have seen, um, and I believe I included a reference to this at the end of the deck, is, uh, it has the, has the full um, list of what can be specified for each of these different um, uh, classes or types in DTDL. So I'll pause here for questions, or if uh, Ellie or Benjamin want to want to jump in uh, with anything additional here. So is it fair to say that you're focusing on the data modeling aspects, but not the protocol level? I don't see any indication of the URLs or HTML or HTTP side. Yeah, so yes, exactly. So at the DTDL level, we haven't focused on, on protocols. Um, and I, there's one area that we actually have um, later on in our collaboration side, but we want to start to figure out how to um, express uh, you know, what, what we call a binding between DTDL and different protocols. Of course, we, we have one that we use for our own services and you know, that, that Microsoft produces. So, um, you know, for example, uh, Azure has an Azure IoT hub that IoT devices can connect to. We have a binding, what we call a binding for that, that, that describes how DTDL connects um, to the protocols that are used there. But um, I think it's an area where we want to actually expand that and collaborate on that um, more generally. Okay. Uh, I have also a question about the data types. Uh, do you have designed your own data type um, or, or do you follow some known data type scheme like from JSON schema or something like that? So we, it, it, I, I guess you'd say we developed our own, I guess. It's, it is expressed in DTDL. It's not JSON schema. Um, we, we looked at JSON schema. Um, but in the end, felt that the so JSON schema allows you to express um, data in terms of JSON, and so limited to the JSON types. And we found that in some cases there were customer use cases where it was more advantageous to be able to have more expressivity in the data types, and so we. Um, we do have a set of the data types that are in DTDL that, um, yeah, I guess it's not really correct to say they're derived from the XML types, but they are, I mean, that's where we, you know, where we started from is the set of XSD uh, types that are, that are represented in, um, in RDF, but they are not those types in, in, in the end. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, great. Let's go on to, so this slide, um, I called the why slide. Um, when we were prepping for this, this meeting, uh, it sounded like there, you know, there were some questions uh, around what, you know, why ETDL and why choices around JSON-LD and, and those kinds of things. So I wanted to put together a slide here and be able to have a chance to talk about some of that. Um, and so one of the, you know, one, I think very reasonable question is to ask why DTDL and not, you know, uh, another modeling language that already exists. Um, and so we, we certainly did look at, you know, a set of other modeling languages that are out there, um, you know, from things like OPC UA uh, and Gorto and others. And um, you know all of those, all of those are great, and all of those actually we have customers that use you know a variety of those modeling languages already for their solutions, and so we certainly want to be able to support those customers. Um, but we also found that 
we wanted to be able to support these other kinds of things in, you know, in our IoT solutions. So things like device modeling and digital twin modeling, we wanted to bring, be able to bring those things together where it's not only about devices. We wanted to be able to express the uh, relationships between digital twins where you can start to build up, like we talked about earlier, start to build up those systems of digital twins through a set of modeled relationships. Um, we wanted linking or reuse where, you know, you could describe um, a, you know, a custom uh, data type or schema, or you could describe a, um, you know, an interface to a digital twin and reuse those things through linking. And we also wanted to be able to do what we call semantic types or, um, you know, a, attach additional semantics to uh, the model elements. So those are some of the reasons why we why we chose DTDL, why we chose to do DTDL and not uh, directly adopt, um, you know, only one of the other modeling languages. So that said, though, what we what we actually expect them to be able to do is customers, like I mentioned, customers are using a variety of different modeling languages. And that's where we want to start to look at the interop between those existing modeling languages and DTDL. We started to do a little of that internally. But I think um, with this meeting with you, um, hopefully we can do have some more discussion about that um, a little bit later on. So I'll actually pause here on this first bullet and see if Elio or Benjamin or want to add anything or if there are any questions on this first bullet. Okay, great. So, um, We've also had heard the question of why why did you choose JSON LB um, and not JSON or something else? And well, when we started this, we actually were pretty sure that we wanted JSON, um, be, both because it's programming language agnostic, and it's something that many developers, uh, you know, broad set of developers are familiar with. Um, and so we we started there, and then as we got into um, Sort of looking at modeling and using JSON and looking at other uh, modeling languages that are out there, um, we realized that we wanted this, wanted reuse and linking, and JSON LD is is really great for that. And um, trying to do something else, you know, in JSON and and you have reuse and linking would probably just lead you to inventing essentially JSON LD again. And so we we pivoted to that um, primarily to be able to pick up that I you know those concepts of of linking that have proven to be useful now for us. Um, and we wanted this idea of semantic types and um, you know, JSON-LD and RDF really allow that to happen. Um, another, another thing I guess that's not on the slide is we also wanted the ability for uh, multiple authors to be able to provide information about a digital twin. So if you imagine a device manufacturer describing their device through a DTDL model, um, that's great. They can describe a bunch of information about that device, but they what they probably don't know is how that device is actually installed. You know, is it installed outside or inside? Um, do, does the does the solution that's going to use that device expect the data to you know expect data there to be uh, stored historically or not? So there's some solution level information that another author may want to provide. And so what we found is that you know, R, through RDF and JSON-LD, the, the ability to be able to provide um, information after the fact, um, you know, or in addition to a model that was provided by an original author uh, was present. And we, and we wanted that idea as well, so that we can have, uh, so that you can build up a view of your digital twin over time from different authors. So I'll pause here again for questions on this second bullet. Well, I was just going to applaud you for doing that. I think following it throughout the life cycle of the node and of digital twin is, is, is a very good approach to take because different things happen at different times in, in the life cycle of the system. So I think that's useful. Yeah, um, yeah, we we think so too. And while we haven't fully realized that in our uh, you know in our current implementations, if you were to look at those, um, that that is uh, something that we do have on our roadmap. 
and and that's why that's one important thing that we're getting out of here is NLD. Yeah, the funny thing is uh, we had actually some similar discussion a few years ago uh, with the thing description, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, really reminds me the the discussion which kind of format we would like to have RDF or Chase LD or ontology etc. And yeah, the best way was Chase LD. Yeah, it was a good decision. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've been pretty happy with our choice of JSON. They actually have a slide on JSON LD. I think maybe next that we can talk some more about our experience there in more detail. Um, I'll I'll spend a, just a brief couple comments on these last couple bullets. I think these get into more more um, details that um, if we're interested, in, we can certainly talk about. But I won't I won't spend a bunch of time here uh, unless there's interest. So one thing that we've seen with um, with some approaches, um, in in particular, when people use OWL ontologies and then create um, what we call instances or entities of those uh, of those um, classes, is that they actually use triples for both um, the uh, class definitions as well as the you know instances or individuals, uh, and that's and that certainly works great um, in that environment. And so you can ask the question then, well, why why didn't we and, and maybe you don't even have this background, but, but we, we actually currently don't represent our entities or instances using triples. And so you could ask the question why we don't do that in our implementations. Um, and we just found that um, really developers weren't quite, broad, broadly speaking, developers weren't quite ready for triples. Um, and we didn't want to have to push the requirement to do triple processing or JSON-LD processing uh, onto customers for every entity. And so we actually have this split where we use JSON LD, RDF, et cetera, for the modeling side. And then on the instance or entity side, we just use uh, you know, traditional REST APIs with just JSON entities. Would you mind going back and talking a bit more about your use cases? So what kinds of contexts and applications YouTube is being used in? Yeah, sure. Um, I, and and Elliot or Benjamin, you can jump in here as well. But uh, I, I would start with there's there's actually a broad set of of different use cases that we see. So one set of use cases that we see are, um, you know, the the physical devices that are that are um, connected into the cloud. So you may have a set of devices that are, um, you know, monitoring some, you know, a a, a, um, a manufacturing line or monitoring uh, something in, you know, in a building, those kinds of things. Um, then we get, and so there's sort of some, a set of device um, oriented use cases where you've got those physical devices, you want to do device management over those devices, you want to be able to um, collect data and analyze data and produce insights from the data coming from those devices. And the modeling there helps us, um, helps the solution understand what the data is that's coming in. Um, before uh, before we had modeling, the solution would have to essentially be coded to understand uh, this piece of data is going to be a number, this piece of data is going to be a string, whatever. Um, and then when we go more more uh, into our digital twin space, we get into use cases like buildings, um, building management, or you know, city management, those kinds of energy grid management, those kinds of use cases where people want to be able to model things that aren't devices. Um, they want to be able to connect them together into systems, and they want to be able to, uh, you know, draw data, you know, aggregate data, produce insights from that data to be able to, you know, improve energy use in a building, for example. Um, and so, from a modeling perspective, we want to be able to provide again the modeling there, where the solution can understand what the, you know, what the um, what the entities are that they're connected to. So they can understand right. the difference between a building and a floor and a room and those kinds of things. Right. So just a follow-on question. Um, have you, can you compare this to like what platform 4.0 has been working on? And in particular, I didn't see you have behavioral modeling explicitly laid out here. Um, can you like comment on like, you know, uh, do a compare and contrast with like the platform 4.0 language, which is name I've forgotten? Um, so, are you asking about um, well, 4.0 yeah. has a language that they use to define digital twins, 
And they actually have a very broad scope and have a, a lot of different aspects of digital twins, including behavior modeling. Um, so um, I guess the question is, have you, uh, can you compare and contrast with what platform 4.0 has been working on? Yeah, and when you ask that, are you talking about OPC UA in that context or a different modern yeah, language? I can't set? remember the name of the language. Does anyone here on, on the call remember it? There's a particular standard language that platform 4.0 has been defining. Oh, you know, I'm blanking and I'll have to get back to you on it. Never mind. No, no, that's okay. I, I, and I was pausing there to see if Elio, if Elio or Benjamin knows. I, so OPC UA, we certainly see in platform 4.0 and in, in industrial IoT, um, which I think is what you're referring to when you say platform 4.0. No, I'm not. Um, There's no language. Oh, you're not. It's, not. it's not tied to OPC UA. It's more general modeling language, more like yours. And uh, Oh, okay. I wish I looked up the name while you were speaking so we could uh, refer to it, but... Uh, but yeah, it's a uh, it's similar concept. Um, I think it also includes like state machine uh, definitions and things like this. Um, so behavior modeling. So so I I don't know that I'm familiar with it then. Um, okay, well, maybe we'll follow up offline. So, I'll, I'll look it up and bring it up next time. Yeah, definitely. Let's let's do a follow up offline on that because it'd be great for us to learn about it as well and understand understand that and be able to connect that. Um, you know. You know, figure out how to connect that, or you know, interoperate between that and DTDL. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna just we we talked briefly about um, our experience with JSON LD, but I, I created a slide here just because we've actually been pretty happy with what with using JSON LD. Um, so one of the first benefits of it, of course, is it's JSON, and that's great because uh, that's pretty well you know, pretty well understood by a broad set of developers. And there's lots of um, tools. There's lots of um, support across, uh, you know, a broad set of languages, programming languages, which is great. Um, but of course, it's also more than just JSON. It's, it actually brings in, in the linking, of course. Um, we found that the spec was a uh, well-written spec and that there were enough tools and libraries for us to learn about it and use it and, and be successful with it. Um, you know, internally before we even went to customers with it. Um, we found in particular, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I mean, my, Microsoft is using a variety of languages, but of course, .NET um, is still probably more used at Microsoft than other languages. Uh, we found that JSONLD had great .NET support um, through uh, some, some uh, open source NuGet packages. Um, and uh, we also do heavily use JavaScript in some of our projects, and we also found good support for Dixon LD in JavaScript. And we ourselves haven't had a chance to to to, or, uh, to dig deeply into Java yet, um, but the, it does sound like there are some libraries that I just can't, you know, we just haven't dug into that to understand the the level of support. Um, so that's been really good for us and for our customers. Um, one of the things, of course, that JSON-LD brings in, and this is really an RDF um, or semantic web thing, is the is the open world assumption, uh, which is is not natural. At least what I found is not natural for uh, for many things or for for developers in the way developers think. And so, um, we actually use Shackle and Shackle concepts internally to put constraints on on this. Um, so, for example, most developers, you know, expect a thing to only have one name, um, uh, but with the open world assumption, a thing could have many names. And when I say name, I mean like the programming name for a thing. They typically expect they, they've given it a name and it has that name, and that's the only name that it has. And so, we we do want to um, meet some of those expectations. And so we use we use internally we use Shackle, um, which if you're not familiar with it, is the shapes constraint language for um for rdf and um and i say and, and i say and shackle concepts because there were some cases where we wanted to be able to represent some constraints that weren't um part of shackle uh and so we but we use the same concepts internally to be able to um to be able to put some of those um constraints on dtdl so that it more matches what a developer expects but we also do like some of the benefits of the open world assumption like um, the semantic type idea, or the idea of that we talked about earlier, the idea of multiple authors contributing to the definition of, of an entity or of a type. 
And so, you know, we, we actually get benefit out of the open world assumption. In some cases, we, we um, put constraints on it. Um, as we expand out from just JSON-LD into some of the other related technology, like Shackle, the shapes constraint language, um, it, uh, Shackle does cover a lot of what we need. And um, we did find there were some constraints that we wanted to express that weren't directly expressible in Shackle. And if you're familiar with Shackle, Shackle has um, basically an escape clause where you can use Sparkle, which is the, uh, actually it's the query language for um, triples. I don't actually know if I know what it stands for. Um, and, we, and we went down that path of using Sparkle to express some of those constraints, but we found in, you know, in our implementations, in our particular use cases, um, that the performance of at least the way we were using it in our in our solution it didn't meet our requirements, and so we've backed off on using that internally for now, um, and going to just some um, you know some code that expresses those in, internal code that expresses those constraints. So I'll pause here in case there's any questions or or any comments or anything. <clears throat> yeah, one of the now that you, you mentioned Sparkle, one of the other things uh, that uh, I have done this week uh, was kicking, <coughs> excuse me, kicking off uh, standardization of JSON path in the IDF. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I mean, this this is a very simple language, but uh, uh, people like the simplicity, and uh, sometimes it actually matches. Uh, simple IoT devices very well. So uh, I hope we will be able to, to point to a standard there within a year or so. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. So in Web of Things, we've been looking at discovery. And discovery is basically getting access to the metadata about devices. And part of that is doing queries on databases. And so part of the reason to have semantic annotation is to be able to find stuff like all the lights in a certain area. Um, mm -hmm. And so Sparkle really, I mean, it can be used for constraints, but it also is obviously a query language, but it's a bit too powerful for constrained devices. So JSON path is not just like, you know, uh, doesn't just let you point at part of a thing unless you do queries. Um, it's actually related closely to XPath, and XPath, uh, even though it's for XML, now is JSON uh, support. Um, so we've been comparing and contrasting those two query languages, but they're more syntactic query languages. So you can search for particular terms, but you can't search for things that are like uh, derived by inference uh, from other terms if you can't list Sparkle. But it's still pretty powerful and pretty useful if you have fairly uh, uh, constrained uh, semantic tagging. Yeah, no, that's that's actually super interesting. So right now in what we've done here with both Shackle and Sparkle um, is we haven't uh, exposed that to customers. This is these comments for more about what we use internally to um, to actually implement the various services and tools that we have around um, DTDL and um, and models. But I think that's but I think what you're kind of getting at is is actually there is value in exposing some of the at least some of the query side for um, people to be yeah. able to use. Yeah, I think that that totally makes sense. Yeah, and actually, the other problem with exposing a Sparkle endpoint is because it's so expensive. You know, you're just asking for trouble. People yeah. coming in your system by by intention or by or by accident. Whereas uh, something like uh, JSON query is much more straightforward and much more you know uh, controllable. Although you probably want to limit the use of arbitrary scripts in it, which it does allow. The problem with JSON path though is not really got a really good spec right now. Um, uh, just like really a blog page, um, and so it, it, as I think was alluded by by Karsten, it needs some work to turn it into a real spec before we can really deploy it. Our, our, our yeah, line. yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, we we um, I think probably aren't at the point where we would entertain exposing Sparkle um, because of the reasons you just said, um, and um, but having something like something more constrained where where we can actually you know, provide some controls at a, you know, at a service level or, you know, e even at the level of, uh, you know, code running on, on an edge or even on a device, that would be useful. Yeah, I think one interesting question is, is there an intermediate level between Sparkle and JSON path? 
So mm -hmm. if they're some way to do simple inferencing, for example, uh, uh, limited in some way so that it's not not just syntactic matching, but we can do sparkle-like things that I mean, all the all the bells and whistles that Sparkle has. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a good question too, because Sparkle is is uh, very powerful, but you can also it can also cost you a lot if you write your query incorrectly or you know maliciously or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so now I think the next couple slides um, get into some of the, uh, you know, sort of expanding beyond just what's in DTDL, but actually how DTDL interoperates um, and where we wanted, you know, where we, where at least we've um, had ideas of around collaboration. So um, to kind of get us into that, this slide talks about some ideas that we um, have around interoperability with other specs. And so um, in particular, uh, We've been internally looking at, um, you know, OWL ontologies as well as OPC UA information models for industrial IoT. Um, and so, when we sort of think about DTDL, um, the, the 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 really that meta model, uh, if you will, is is that it's analogous to OWL or the OPC UA information model, and then uh, the DTDL models are those, you know, either um, the things you express using OWL or the um, models you express using the OPC information model, for example. Um, and in many cases, at least for the things that we've looked at and experimented with, we've seen reasonable transformations to and from DTDL models. Um, we, we don't think they're perfect. We think that um, they're, you know, depending on what features of different um, uh, modeling languages have been used. That not everything may be expressible, you know, either in DTDL or maybe there's some things in DTDL that could be expressed somewhere else. Um, from a DTDL perspective, uh, what the way we've looked at this is um, using semantic types or extension types or whatever um, for for this interoperability or extensibility. And so this example here that I'm showing, um, if you're familiar with OPC UA, OPC UA has um, the has uh, node IDs in this particular format that identifies the, the node, um, this I equals number structure. And in DTDL, for example, that is not, uh, that contains characters that aren't allowed in a DTDL name. Uh, we don't allow the equals. Um, we only allow really alphanumeric characters um, because it's designed to be used in, a, in programming languages. Um, and so, you know, you, you then have this problem where this particular, you know, if you, if you were translating between OPC UA and DTDL, how do you represent that special ID that OPC UA has so that you don't lose that data so that you could go into DTDL and still then consume a DTDL model that referenced back to some, you know, OPC UA element. And um, what we've looked at here is this idea of, of these extension types. Uh, which you can see an example of here, where someone could define an extension type. I just made this one up called OPC UA property. Um, and so on a property in a DTDL model, I could add in this additional type that's called OPC UA property. And then that property can come with, um, you know, its set, of, its set of properties that can be expressed uh, in that element. In particular, this one, I just made this up. I called it node ID. And that, that node ID could carry that extra information from OPC UA. So we've started to look at this idea of being able to um, carry information along in DTDL that may not be directly represented in core DTDL through this extension type mechanism. Now, this extension type mechanism is more right now kind of on paper. There's a little bit of it implemented, but it's not fully there in all of our implementations yet, but it's something that we're experimenting with. I'll pause if there's any questions or comments on this one. Yeah, uh, you seem to imply that your processor would only recognize the node ID, you know, keyword, let's call it, if you also have type uh, OPC UA property. Is that is that the case? I mean, you don't have to add something to the context file to get it to recognize that? Um, oh, actually, right. There is a bug on this slide. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there would be an additional context here. You're absolutely right. So no, no big problem, but yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, no, but so, yeah, 
um, there would be an additional context to bring in the definition. That's actually how we how uh, we've looked at adding uh, allowing models model authors to express the use of additional extension types is by adding additional context. Um, that would then um, you would then have uh, in essence the definition. And if you look at this from a DTDL parser perspective, what happens there is that um, is that the 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 parser actually would um, expect to have to be loaded with uh, what we call I guess call a package and um, we haven't settled on all the names but a package of the definitions of what OPCUA property is um, you know in in um, essentially in uh, a set of RDF classes and we would the if the parse the you know our DTL parser then would then say okay I now understand what OPCUA property is and I understand that it has this um, a, a additional field called node ID. And so that actually, this actually then does form a legal DTDL, DTDL interface, and in particular, a, a, a legal DTDL property because it understands that uh, that additional extension. So does the shackle product help you do that? Or do you have to write additional code to associate those two? It seems like shackle might be able to do that, but. Um, I, I would have to go. So I am not the expert on it everything we did with with shackle and outside of shackle we'd have i'd have to go look specifically but yes we are using where we can it, this is exactly where at least our implementation and our parser where we do use shackle to say look um this like property is defined actually now remembering so when we define property um ourselves we define it as an rdf class but we also define the shackle constraints that go with that and that is where we say property must have name and it must be a string and it must have schema and it must be, you know, one of these elements. Um, and then optionally you could have description and, and display name and those things, right? Um, yeah, yeah. The shackle rules are what you normally yeah. would do with like a JSON schema to process a JSON to process a JSON LD, you use shackle rules. Yep. And so then when someone authors this this OPCUA property element, they would do the same thing. They would describe it, uh, you know, what they can describe in RDF, they would describe that as an RDF class, and then they would also provide the constraints. So like, for example, OPCUA property might always require a node ID to be there. That could be expressed in that extension. Yeah, thank that you. Way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so then that sort of leads us to, and this is one, you know, one of our last um, slides. Um, uh, I think there's a discussion slide. Yeah, but um, so this is really leads us to uh, hopefully where maybe we can have a little more discussion, um, or, uh, you know, kind of gauge interest. But um, we put together a list of of areas that we um, are interested in collaborating on. Things that um, you know we we want to get uh, more into with DTDL. And so that's this list you can see here. So I've talked about some of these already where, you know, conversions to and from other specs, um, OWL ontology interoperability, because um, we see a number of at least our customers using OWL ontologies for different things like building management, um, energy grid management, those kinds of things. Um, more collaboration around extensibility. Um, we've mentioned protocol bindings before. And then, um, uh, this other one here, this cross language open source software stacks is, um, we found, you know, like I mentioned before, we found some really good, um, uh, really good libraries in some programming languages, and um, not as much support in others. And so we're interested in that as well, in sort of beefing this up to having, you know, a good set of cross-language open source software stacks for for really primarily JSON LD um, that would be production grade and that would be tooling ready um, for us as well. And then more stuff that we probably haven't thought of, but um, and then lastly, I just mentioned on this slide the Digital Twin Consortium, which is a um, a, a consortium that Microsoft and many other um, uh, companies and organizations are a group of where um, it's designed to influence digital twin technology, and um, it's a place where it looks like there's um, some collaboration that will be starting up there on DPL. So yeah, so I wanted to pause here and actually kind of open things up to discussion, um, other ideas for collaboration, find out what, what you're interested in, where we can work together more. 
Um, yeah, I have a comment to so um, Sebastian here. So, um, uh, did you already uh, the W3C Web of Things activity since uh, we started in New Java beginning of this year and we have there the topic Sync Description Template? And the Sync Description Template is actually, I would say, 100% identical what you're doing. Yeah. And um, I did a few months ago, I did a kind of comparison of uh, DTDL and uh, single script template. And if you like, I can quickly show you the comparison if you're interested in. And sure, sure. Yeah. Do you want to do that here or um, at another it's, time? It's just one, one slider which I can let's, share you. So it's. Let's do it. Do I have to? Yeah. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah, and just so you have some context as well, we have been looking at Web of Things um, and sort of keeping you know track of what's what's being released there um, publicly, and um, and I agree. Like there's a there is a lot of a lot of overlap and similarity here, and so I think it would be great to you know to have some more discussions. Um, we've seen Web of Things sort of evolve over the years, as you know, as you can imagine, DTDL evolving as well. Um, and so uh, it, it's been good to see. I, I was already in exchange with Chris Green. Is he still involved in that topic? He is no longer involved um, on that. So we should probably, you know, have you connect with others, uh, me for sure, and, and, and Elio, and probably yeah. Benjamin as well. Ah, that, that's then uh, then I understand why he's maybe not answering my emails anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I understand. Okay. But uh, can you see my screen or my my slide here? Yes. Okay. Great. So um um I I did a comparison with the detailed DLL version. Uh, I think this was the first version, so it's not uh, up to date. But I think it still looks very similar. And yeah. Um. And I compared this uh, with what we are um, named as Sync Description Template here. Mm -hmm. And I took an uh, example from your web page and I said, okay, let's define completely the identical thing with Sync Description Template. And you can see there's really the identical information in there. Uh, the except the change is that we just say, okay, this is as the Sync Description form. So we have our own namespace for that, uh, that is also by the W3C. And what you see here, I just integrate your context, which you have defined also here in the uh, on the button. Can you see my mouse? Yep, I can. Yep. Yeah. So we just integrate that, and then we are simple. You define all this identical stuff. What you have there, so you have the ID here, you have the add type here. So we have the thing um, as a core uh, class definition in thing description, which we integrate. And then I simply say, okay, this uh, definition follows the interface from, from the DTL. Um, except of the display name, we have using title. The title is something, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just a different name. And uh, yes, and what is also a little bit different, but only a naming thing, uh, is uh, what you call as property command telemetry is at the uh, WTC Web of Things property action event. But it's uh, completely the same intention mm -hmm. that, yeah? And Sebastian, you could still add at type telemetry in the definition for the temp event and actually connect this semantically to the DTTL ontology. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, one- and You could say at type uh, Azure property or whatever, Azure colon property, Azure, Azure colon telemetry. Yeah, yeah that, would, so that, would, I, that would help. I also want to say we shouldn't put too much emphasis on the change in syntax because in fact, our original syntax for Web of Things looked very much HDL under JSON 1.0. It's only when we went to 1.1 that we could switch to the, you know, uh, map approach that was a little bit cleaner and, and a bit more, didn't have to have all the at, at types everywhere. But uh, I think um, you know we, we should look in in the devils in the details here in terms of you know are they really interconvertible are the details and how you handle events for example that don't map one to one so I think we it'd be useful to look into the details here but I think yeah at the highest level we are very clear the one thing we do have though is we have forms which basically create a protocol binding 
Yep. There is additional uh, aspect in, in yeah. the protocol plans. Yes, uh, that's right. But uh, this is not the uh, focus in the template, right? So the template is actually oh, uh, information. That, uh, that's true. In terms of integration, this week you could provide a TD template and, and a TD that would give a web of things uh, interface to a DTDL system that uses DTDL. And likewise, you could probably import things as TD templates into DTDL. So it could probably work both ways. You could have things that are described using TD that you could import. And it seems like yeah. this is pretty low friction and low loss. Well, the question is, can we turn that probably into a certain way? You know, uh, is is there uh, running on a plug fest? <laughs> yeah, is there a project we can define where we really, you know, try to build a a, a bidirectional converter, for example, mm -hmm. and really discover whatever all the little uh, you know corner cases and things? I suspect there are some, uh, especially under events and actions, because uh, we ran into a lot of fun fun things about and things like you know, but uh, I think it's uh, definitely worth looking at. To uncover gaps, at the very least, but but yeah, I think if it's just a different syntax and there's a, there's a bidirectional converter, then for example, having links in a thing description that point to a DTTL as its you know template would then be feasible if they be formally interconverted. Yes, and I actually think that's a super interesting idea of um, being able to just from. Uh, you know, from a model being able to reference uh, a, another a, a model that is at least at least um, you know is maybe RDF uh, under the covers. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm very interested in understanding where we can do that versus conversion. Like I think conversion is you know uh, you know is is useful and is probably valuable in many cases. But I can also imagine if someone's already got their their TD template, for example, or a set of those for for their um, solution, why even convert them? Could we reference well, those? You know, yeah, I that would be great. It, I, or the other I, way around. If only converted, I just meant are they semantically equivalent? Yeah. If it's possible to do a one to one conversion, then they're semantically equivalent. And then you could just, you know, get the information directly. And yeah. I'm just saying proving that they're equivalent can be accomplished by building a converter. Um, yeah. I guess another question here, though, is what's your standardization plan? So, are you planning to uh, you know, proceed with a standards body uh, for the TL? Yeah, I um, I don't know, Elio or Benjamin, if you have more, if you would have more context on that question. Hi, this is Elio. Uh, so, uh, we're um, the long term plan is uh, definitely we would like to make this a standard. Uh, we do not have uh, a plan that is uh, publicly shareable right now. Um, right. we're, we're definitely working on it. We're very eager. Uh, we know that to a certain extent we're um, uh, late starting that. We're just like so busy getting stuff out. Um, so that's definitely high on our priority, but we don't really have like a specific plan. We're also open to suggestions. I, I think Brian was like very, very good uh, with that. If we say, hey, look, just, should you consider this organization or this specific thing seems relevant? We're definitely open to those kind of suggestions as well. well we're, we're doing our own process internally, but uh, uh, de definitely very open to see what what's the best avenue. We absolutely want to have like an open stance. We're working on how to uh, have a more formal way to uh, um, start collaborating on on the new things that we're doing on this. And uh, um, we're definitely definitely eager like to start being uh, um, uh, to make this like more of a, a standard and open process, open development process, like in general. Uh, oh, go uh, ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know how you are open to maybe to uh, that we maybe can invite you to one of our next um, um, Web of Things meetings uh, where we're discussing the template stuff. And uh, um, I don't know uh, if you're interested. In it, I think we can, yeah, plan something and if you can join of our meetings. Yeah, I think for I think that would be uh, great. Um, and I, I know we haven't really reached out on that. Um, it sounds like you've talked to Chris Green in the past, and we, it sounds like we should, um, you know, refresh that refresh that contact and conversation, get that going a little bit more. 
Yeah, and this was actually what I was uh, with Chris Green uh, exchanging, and and yeah, and then one day he doesn't answer anymore, and mm -hmm. uh, so. But I think it, it's really almost identical what we're doing, and uh, I think we will will be more strong uh, in working on that. And um, right, and uh, if you are planning to also to to address protocol bindings, I think this is what we already did in a couple of years about this, and have a lot of experience and addressing this in plug fests, etc. I think you can really benefit of that. And this is yeah, Benjamin yeah. speaking. Can, can uh, maybe, maybe the group at large help us uh, at Microsoft understand when where you would see um, in in the future um, the discussions happening? Because I mean, there's DTDL. We're we're on GitHub, so maybe like the the particular example that you shared, Sebastian, that could be an issue where we discuss the stuff. But of course, that also has some uh, web of things uh, bits to it. So. Discussion could also be on uh, the Web of Things mailing list, and or this could be someplace else. Uh, where do you guys see like the best forum to uh, to have at least the public part of the discussions, which I hope would be the, the bulk of, of the discussions? You know, well, one constraint of the Web of Things meeting is we have to satisfy the the W three C's pad policies, etc. And there's different forms of meetings we could we could adopt. But it would essentially be public. Uh, uh, see, if you want to have, you know, under NDA or some uh, under intermediate form of, of confidentiality, we have to make different arrangements. But if you're on public GitHub right now, I think it's really Yeah, and uh, Microsoft is member, uh, of course, member of the WC, and they are also member of the Web of Things interest group. So it's quite easy to, yeah. To contribute or already agreed to the to the legals so it's just a matter of uh making sure what you state in those meetings is informs what you want to say under those constraints um so certainly that's that's feasible and as we said we have a charter to build a template definition so i think you know that would be one path for the like, fast track standardization effort right? Uh, might have to tweak a few things to bring things into alignment um, on both our sides, but I think it'd be very valuable for us to be in alignment a, a year and a half from now, right? Mm -hmm. I think having two different standards that differ only in the names of things is kind of awkward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I think it'd be great to have some more conversations around this in particular. Yeah, well, you, you asked uh, what would be a good forum for conversations about this. You, you are in one of those forums. Uh, so this is exactly what we have uh, created Wishy for, to get, get an open conversation going on between different uh, players. And uh, of course, it would be possible to continue this conversation here as well. Before our time runs out, uh, I wanted to quickly show a couple of slides that we made this morning. Uh, Sebastian, I'm going to steal your presentation. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Some examples. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Uh, we, we looked at one of the examples in, in the uh, GitHub repository, which, which is the copy to you on the slide. It will look familiar to you. Of course, it's another thermostat. Uh, and uh, th there are things in there like telemetry, uh, property, and command, which are in, in SDF events, uh, uh, properties, and, and actions, and uh, various descriptions, and, and schemas, and, and so on. And uh, there's uh, also, uh, for, for the action here, the temperature report, there is a return type, which, which is described by, by a schema. And uh, essentially, the, the terminology here pretty much maps to SDF ter terminology. So property action event is property command telemetry. Uh, object is probably close to component. We may have to work a little bit on the object. Uh, terminology, input data and output data as request and response, label is display name, 
and so on. So that, that's pretty much a, a one to one thing. So it, it will be pretty easy for a translator to actually handle this. And then, of course, the, 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 there are uh, things like like uh, JSON schema org uh, descriptions, which, which uh, I think uh, it's good not to include. Um, and uh, these, but these can be mapped with little effort uh, between the DL and NSTF. So it, it should be easy to to write a converter from from DTL to NSTF. And uh, we just went ahead and and uh, translated the thing in, into. Um, SDF, and you can see it, it actually looks pretty similar. So it, it invents a few new terms like uh, SDF thing here, uh, which is the, the uh, whole thing, a temperature controller uh, with a, a property that is serial number and is of type string. So that, that's just a, a different way of, of doing this. Then we have an, an action called reboot, which has uh, input data which is defined somewhere else here uh, since. Um, and we, in the thing, we have two objects, thermostat 1 and uh, thermostat 2, uh, and some device information. Of, I, I have no idea what that is. Uh, so uh, we, we didn't get it uh, this morning. And uh, the actual uh, thermostat is an SDF object, which in turn has an SDF event. And that is a little bit clumsy in, in uh, SDF right now so you have to have a pointer to to a data structure here the stf output data uh, maybe we can clean it up in the, in the next version a little bit we have a property uh, we have two properties target temperature and, and max temp since last reboot and again these are uh, json schema org uh, type descriptions with type number units is something that is specific to to sdf that is using the set ml unit names um, and we could make another table that maps the cinema unit names to the GTDL uh, unit names. Um, so it should be relatively easy to, to get uh, a converter going between the two. And this is really what we are trying to push forward in, in the SDF world, that we actually have uh, converters. And we have a process called pressure, pressure testing, which means we, we feed models into the converters and see can we actually generate useful SDF uh, for that, uh, and uh, that, that is essentially what moves the language forward. So, for instance, if you look closely into this SDF action, that is a little bit clumsy how how the output data uh, is defined with all these JSON pointers. So maybe we can make this a little bit uh, simpler. Yeah, and and the the actual SDF data are the data types that are defined here are are pretty uh, straightforward. So th this is really one of the things that, that we, we could uh, push forward quickly, make sure we have the converters uh, available. And to do this, of course, it would be nice to have more than two DTDL models. Uh, so if, if you have 100 or so, that, that would be good for, for uh, actually pressure testing uh, converter. So if you can point us to, to resources we can use uh, for that. That would be very useful, and of course, it would also allow us at, at the SDF side uh, to make sure we actually can take in uh, these DTDL uh, uh, models and, and represent them in, in SDF. Yeah, I think this is really encouraging, actually. Um, I, I have to apologize. I'm not super familiar with SDF, but I already took a note um, earlier on to go look, learn more about it after this meeting. Um, so I will definitely go do that for myself. Um, I think in terms of getting more DTDL models, um, we should be able to provide some more of those. Um, you know, many of the ones that we're working with that, that, that we see internally are, are from customers. Um, and so we probably wouldn't be able to share those, but there probably are, I, I do believe that we have a good set of, of example models uh, for sure around the digital twin space. So things that are, some devices, but also some non-device things. Um, and so I think we can probably pull from those um, examples and tutorials that we have to get a better set here. And just to ask, are you familiar with the one data model work? Uh, I guess for me, I, and I don't know if, if, the, uh, if uh, Elliot or Benjamin are, I, I've heard the name, but I actually also haven't spent enough time to dig in there. So I've got that mm -hmm. note as well that I took. Um, even you know when you were talking about it before our meeting, before our part. 
Yeah, it would be interesting to look at how you uh, how you have models to represent things like uh, the temperature transmitter or you know um, um, level control or something like that, right? A PID mm -hmm. controller. You must have some some generic DTDL models that aren't super specific or proprietary, um, and just to see how the URIs map to the concepts and and um, is an interesting thing because we have we have um, that as really a, a, you know application vocabularies as this other layer that that I would say IoT schema and one data model mostly work on, and it seems like you have some intersection around creating these standard application vocabularies as well. Yeah, actually, to that point, um, we've actually, for for now, anyways, sort of purposely stayed away from trying to create, um, you know, a set of of models for a, you know for any particular domain, whether it's you know IoT devices or building management or energy management or anything. More thinking that what we want to try to do there is engage with uh, the domain experts to to help us build those up. And so mm -hmm. we don't currently have, uh, we aren't currently pushing, you know, a set of, if you're implementing a thermostat, you should use this, this DTDL model. Yeah. So actually, I think one data model has two things that are interesting. One is the large collection of, you know, actual device models. Mm -hmm. The other is just kind of a framework in terms of, you know, capabilities and objects and, and kind of like a modularity. And one thing that occurred to me previously, I mentioned, you know, we have this gap between full sparkle semantic queries and kind of pure syntactic queries, which only give us one, you know, particular keyword. I think a interesting intermediate zone there is if we have, you know, a particular semantic structure in place that is, for example, hierarchical. Like maybe we don't allow cycles and graphs. We don't allow like trees or or, or some kind of more strict uh, subclassing mechanism. And the inference seems a lot easier and a lot more efficient. And it might be very interesting to look at you know more constrained uh, semantic models that are still powerful enough to capture the things you want to talk about in IoT space. You know, we kind of have that, and I think that if you look at what where this some other work is going, and maybe what Milan is going to show later, we're we're working on aligning the semantic categories between across. You know, I've looked at fourteen different models, and so that right. gives us this this consistent meta model that does provide the part of the constraint that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it'd be very interesting to uh, think about also, like I said, the what kind of inferencing do we need? And I think a lot of it is simply superclass subclass type of inferencing, right? Mm -hmm. and that can be a lot more efficient than just general graph, you know, inferencing. And I think, you know, maybe we should talk about, you know, what kind of semantic uh, inferencing or, or, or abstraction capabilities do we need in a query language? And how does this map onto the, the structure? Anyways, I think the one data model is not only talking about this, you know, collecting a bunch of models, it's also talking about the structure. Yeah, and I actually think that point's really interesting. Um, the, you know what? How much inferencing do you actually, you know, do you actually need for solutions? Um, what, what we're seeing right now is many of our customers aren't really there on, you know, uh, uh, needing inferencing or or understanding what the use cases are. So we ourselves don't, I, I would right. say, don't fully understand what's needed there. Right now, customers seem to be at the place where they do want um, the, uh, you know, a graph of digital twins. So a system of digital twins represented, they want to be able to model that graph as well as have the entities or instances of that. And then they want to be able to query that at least at, at a graph level, you know? So right. I, I know well, I have a device failing, tell me what building that device is in, right? And so that's yeah, sort of right. I think right. doing some like thought experiments about, you know, I am a user, I need to do this task. What kind of queries will I write? I might want to know what kind of lights are used for task lighting. I need to access all the task lights or all the hallway lights or, yep. you know, uh, or all the incandescent lights or I need to look, look at power consumption for things on this floor. I think if we think about, you know, work through it, what kind of inferencing capabilities we want, I can certainly, like I said, I, I think abstraction, I, I want to know all the lights, not just the incandescent lights, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to have like a super class ability to search for things. Maybe I only only tag things as being you know a certain you know model of light, but it's it's a subclass of of a more general classic light. So when I search on lights. I should pick up all the things that are tagged as fluorescent lights. So I think we can define some use cases and then go back 
I think the opportunity exists when you're talking about JSON path standardization. Maybe there can be some simple extension of JSON path as part of that that lets us get capture some of these cases. So yeah, I think, I think that's that, what we want. Yeah, I think that that actually sounds like I just took a note there because um, it sounds like this could be another good area of collaboration for us to. You know, figure out what are the, the use cases and then what does that look like uh, in terms of query that'd be valuable for us as well. Okay, I put the agenda slide because we, we have uh, three more things we want to do. Maybe we should, because I, I have the projector right now, uh, quickly do one thing, which is talk about the next meeting and maybe we can continue some of this. Uh, discussion uh, there in the next meeting. So we, we are meeting in Wishy about, about once a month, but uh, probably should be pausing in, in August uh, because Europe shuts down in, in August. And uh, we're right now looking uh, at the next meeting in mid-September in, in week 38. Uh, sorry, we Europeans have that weeks are numbered, so it's uh, September 14th to uh, 18th. Is that fundamentally a bad idea for anyone here? Okay, so what we will do is we will send a doodle to the Think to Think Research Group mailing list and, and uh, everyone who is not subscribed to that, this is a low volume mailing list, so uh, it, it's uh, probably a good idea to uh, join that, to know what's what's going on in the Think to Think research group in, in the uh, wishy activity, and then we can look when exactly uh, we are going to have uh, the next meeting. Okay, Christian, I did, I did put in the minutes uh, all the Web of Things conflicts that I know about for the next year, basically. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had a question for the uninitiated. Uh, week thirty-eight is what? Which date would that be? Uh, September fourteenth to eighteenth. Okay, thanks. Intel had the manufacturing work weeks that started not according to calendars or work weeks. Can be confusing. Okay. There is an ISO standard for these week numbers. Um, oh, I'm sure there's a standard for <laughs> okay, so um, any other things we should be doing about DTDL before we go to the last two items? So I'll, I'll wait for some pointers uh, uh, from Brian to more DTDL models we might be crunching. Is there anything you, you would want from us? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the things we had talked about from our side that we wanted to to get out of this call and is is how to collaborate going forward and what the areas of collaboration, areas of interest are. And I think we got uh, some of those and as next steps. So um, what I've got is yes, sending um, the uh, some more models uh, and then also looking at um, collaboration between SDF and DTDL, as well as Web of Things in DTDL. And I should, as I say, 1DM, SDF, Web of yeah, Things. By the way, Brian, if you look at it, 1DM uh, um, and SDF are kind of 1DM, or rather, SDF comes from the 1DM group. So it is basically the same thing in a sense. It's not two different things, except it also has the uh, data models that uh, Michael mentioned earlier as part of its uh, work scope. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so, so those things, so those, well, that's what I have in my notes and those seems like, those seem like good, uh, for me, good, good next steps and areas to start. Does that match what others were thinking? Yeah, I think concretely for web of things stuff, I sent an email to me or, or Sebastian and we can collaborate on those things. I guess for SDF, I'd su I suggest Michael Coster as being the point of contact. Great. Thanks.
Oh yeah, I was I was a bit a bit distracted. Yes. Sorry to volunteer you. <laughs> yeah, I was Thanks actually. Look, Brian. Mm -hmm. This has been super good, and I now now I wish we would have booked even more time uh, for for this discussion, but very much looking forward to to the follow follow up discussions and see what comes out of this. So yeah, no, uh, thanks for thanks. Well, thanks for reaching out to us. I, th I think that uh, Jonathan might have been the one who first reached out. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, I'm glad we got connected and actually thanks for having us um, uh, join your meeting and giving us a chance to, to share what we're doing with DTDL. Absolutely. And, and let's let's keep this up. And very really much hope you will be able to join to the follow up meetings um, mid September, and we we can take it forward from there. Unfortunately, I I will be still away uh, in September, but looking forward to see where this goes when I, when I'm back in game. Yeah, I think that that sounds good. Okay, wonderful. So that was a pretty good segment. So. Um, yeah, Milan, do you want to talk about the semantic technology landscape update? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't have much, so in terms of, I'm trying to share my slide, but it's not showing up. Well. And if you can get a little bit closer to your microphone, that would help. I was that the problem last time I supposedly had fixed it. Uh, does it not show? It, it still sounds like you're about 200 meters away. Still? Okay, anyway. Slightly I, I better. Now, but, uh, yeah, slightly better. Uh, now, what happened? I'm sorry, the, the, the disappeared from me and I got the Microsoft chat out now. So for those of you not familiar with uh, WebEx, you can actually zoom in in WebEx. So, so it's... Not necessary no, to make this full screen. I'm trying to share the app, and now it's not showing the that option, which normally it does. WebEx is a bit weird. No, I, I, I was using it yesterday, but it seems like a different version of WebEx. I have something. I, I'm sharing my just everyone can zoom in with the controls at the right side of of the slide, and then you can move the the image back, and then you will have something like a full screen view. And it now disappeared on me. Uh, okay, it's acting up uh, the WebEx for me, but uh, that will mean that the wrong. Uh, I mean, we won't be debugging it uh, now. So you do have something, right? I, I see. I see a slide, and if you can avoid putting other windows on top of this, I thank you. I, I'm, I'm trying just to share the content, not the slide. I can make it bigger. So. I, I, I think it's the way it is now. I think we should just proceed. Okay. So anyway, not much has happened. Uh, I, I just thought in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, I guess everybody remembers it was a month ago already. We discussed whether we should do a document that does uh, a description of IoT standards in a common way so that uh, one can relate. So basically do, do the abstract definition of, of, of the problem and the concept. Actually, I had that slide. I wasn't sure if Microsoft guys are going to be there or not. But uh, we wanted to create a paper DLTG draft uh, that does standards description in a consistent manner. And, and we discussed what it should, shouldn't do. Um, I did a straw man on the common criteria. There was a proposal, not much discussion. And Michael Coster and Michael McCool offered to contribute some of the previous work and the work in progress that they had. So in terms of, so I was thinking, OK, we need to start. And um, uh, I have some pros that I want to use for this document, at least that I will use in the initial draft of the document. And so we need to start the document. I don't know if there are volunteers other than myself who can do this in two ways. Uh, I can wait for volunteers or I can, again, do a straw man write-up and then, then we can uh, uh, pile on that. 
Uh, yeah. My belief is, and I don't know if that's shared by others, that uh, we should aim for a more general audience, not just uh, infomodel connoisseurs like us, I mean, people who are familiar with at least one and probably several models, but rather to somebody, a, a more general practitioner or researcher of IoT who basically is kind of aware of the problem, but not of the details. So I, I would suggest have some pros to explain the lay of the land, what it is, and in addition to tables and comparisons. I think just tables and comparisons, in my experience, don't quite communicate the um, same thing. They're complementary, but pros is important. So in any case, I was going to draft some pros after August, as, as Karsten pointed out, and include uh, the criteria and terminology description, and hopefully elicit some feedback from this group on the written documents, I guess, based on the past experience of the documents we were recently reviewing, that might work better than, than just the PowerPoint solicitation. And then, yes. uh, is there a question? Well, um, I'll wait until you're finished talking, sorry. Oh, I can, uh, it's fine. Uh, it's, uh... Well, yeah, so I was gonna say, uh, I'm happy to contribute. I think we need to focus on here is just getting logistics set up. Uh, so that we can do so, um, you know, setting up, you know, a GitHub repo or whatever, um, maybe a meeting with a smaller number of people so that we can just okay. pull on and, and, and work on things. Um, and uh, I think I can start as simple as an email between, uh, I think Michael Coster and myself volunteered already. I think if others want to do that, we could start with us three. But I think we just need to get the uh, logistics started out and get started. Okay. Um, so what's the right way to do this? Is it a GitHub repo with uh, uh, a uh, an MD file or whatever for the uh, an IDF uh, template? So for, for starting, it's actually even simpler to just do this on a wiki page, uh, right. but we can move that to a GitHub uh, repo uh, because the, the GitHub wikis actually are markdown files, so you can just seamlessly move them yeah. over to the repo and do a more structured approach. Yeah, I think GitHub gives us issues and PRs and things like this. So I think that'd yeah. be more, more appropriate. Okay. Either we're going to, so. so Karsten, you're suggesting uh, the wishy wiki, right? To start with. Yeah, but Michael like said he wants to have issues and, and pull requests and so on. So maybe we can can really jump into a markdown document right away. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. we can then stick on a GitHub repo somewhere and uh, get started. And then we can start uh, yep. chucking, chucking content in. What's a good name for the oh. repo? Um, well, um, I guess we should probably name it after the eventual uh, probably publication it's going to become in I I ITRF. So isn't there a convention for like a, a, a you know author's name and then a, a title? Yeah, let's do that part, making it an internet draft later, and, and okay. just collect markdown text for the moment. Yeah. So, so I do think we call you STL for semantic technology landscape, or well, I just need yeah, it? Yeah, IoT. So I, I think IoT dash semantic dash landscape might be fine. Okay. okay. Um, I think IoT needs to be in there just to avoid conflicts with other things, people doing stuff. Got to be in the T two P R G. Excuse me, in the Ruchi, um Okay, yes, that's fine. In that case, I think semantic technology is, is a fine repo. Okay. Our, our semantic landscape may be better. Okay, so Karsten, you are creating that, right? I'm creating it right now. Yeah, that's what I figured out. I'm just thinking. Great. And so I guess we also have like tables and uh, you know CSV files or spreadsheet stuff stuff too, right? Yeah, we can uh, cluster. I, I, as I said, I'll, I'll move the pros and then we can see what it amounts to and, and take it from there. Um, I, I was going to, and, and then I, I think uh, do a rough draft and 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 solicit the group comments in terms of the direction and and the level of content. I think that's uh, that's what I would yeah. like to do before we get too deep into a particular path, whatever it is. So I think the next lo next logical thing to do here is to get volunteers, maybe, you know, organize a meeting. So we're dealing with like three people instead of 20 or whatever. Um, 
and work on on handing out subtasks. Okay. And, uh, and one other thing I was going to propose, which we don't have to do now, but as, as a thing going forward, as we start describing individual standards, I think it would be very useful for a number of reasons to have contributions and at least feedback from STO authors of, of those standards we want to cover. And, right. uh, so I think in the group we should put some pointers I have for lightweight m to m Jorge, I was going to do possibly for more CF Michael if he wants to be noted. But yeah. If he's a co-author and you too, they can, uh, you know, we can shape it in a way that represents OCF properly anyway. And, uh, and the same for Web of Things, uh, because ideally uh, I want to keep the editorial authority with, with the authors of the paper. But, but give every input, get every input from the guys who actually do it and make sure that their stuff is represented fairly in the sense of whatever, in the context of the paper. So that, that could be ideal. I would like to, with the group, help identify for, for the initial set of things. Uh, I said we have lightweight M to M. I think IPSO is now basically, I, I see them as the same. And OCF and Web of is, is what I would start with. And then yeah. we can try to do that and then iterate in terms of, you know, are we getting the vocabulary, use it as a pressure test, are we getting the vocabulary right and the taxonomy and, and covering uh, the, the right basis and then possibly expand it way to others. At that point, I would declare a version of something or another of the paper and then go forward. I mean, and then we revisit and go forward. So that's basically the suggestion. And, Okay, so people can can send me the GitHub account so I can add them to uh, this repository. We can start right away. Okay. Send right them away. to me in the chat here. Justin, August is in two days, and, and then we stop or what? <laughs> Are we doing this the European way? I'm in Europe, so I'm inclined to take the other talk. But anyway, we'll, we'll send emails. Michael, who, whom do you want to be the the ringleader on, on, on emails and on stirring the pot? I think you're this ringleader. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yep. Um, yeah. By the way, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and a lot of people want to see something like this done, but uh, fewer people <laughs> want to bother with it. It's, it, it's, a, it's a sizable one of those. It should be done. Okay. Justin, you want this in the chat note or you want to actually by uh, whatever works for you. I'll send you, no, I'll send you email. My WebEx went to send minimalistic mode with the by it's playing numbers on me. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's what I had. So that's how we can get uh, started. We, we have 10 minutes left and I really wanted to hear Sebastian's idea, so I hope uh, you don't mind if we switch to Sebastian now. Sebastian, can you go ahead? Yeah, um, I start to share my screen. So can you see my... Yes. My browser? Okay. Um, well, so... Um, I would like to uh, present the idea which we would like to uh, uh, start now at a uh, W3C Web of Things uh, group, namely to define for the COA protocol um, RDF representation for that. So maybe you are already familiar with the Web of Things and Things description that we have also covered protocol bindings in there. So that means we are, uh, first of all, thing description are independent of protocol. So you can define your property action events. And if you have knowledge about a protocol, which is used for exchanging the data, then you can also specify that. Yeah. And um, so that means if you have HTTP as example, then you will provide the URL of the resource and you will provide a method which have to apply to 
the resource or if you have a get put post etc and and the idea what we have what we like to do is that we are um yeah try to cover as much as possible um, protocols which are out there so i would say the most heavily used iot protocols like mqtt http co-op um, etc so there is the idea to to cover them and uh, for http there is already um, rdf representation ever able so that means we can simply reuse existing term definitions which um, can be assigned to http so we can simply reuse the ontology file for http so we can for example name the method name or method um, term to say okay this is this resource has to apply a get method for example and for the same thing we would like to do for the other protocols like for co-op and we have already written down this um, terms which we i think is a kind of min, um, a small set which would be cool to uh, to have also the terms defined as a rdf so that we can simply integrate them in a thing description and and you will find here in the binding uh, template document um, already the first uh, proposal of the terms however we don't have rdf representation behind so we don't have uh, ontology which simple lists all the terms uh, in in a formal array which we can simply integrate uh, in the thing description yeah and this is the idea of the of the of the work that we are starting this kind of um, yeah, process to define an ontology, RDF ontology for co-op, where we can use or reuse the existing terms, which should be very equivalent what you can find also in the co-op specification, also in RDF-based um, representation like in thing description. And um, right, and the reason why I like to uh, start the discussion here, so first of all, I would like to make aware of that. So we did around one month ago a kind of kickoff meeting, and um, and one of important point is um, that the ITF should be aware of that activity, and we would also get a, I would say, kind of official okay with that. That is. Uh, uh, a kind of agreement that we are doing this kind of work because co-op belongs to IDF, as you know, and and what we just want to do is to make our RDF representation of the most common used terms um, uh, in co-op there. And, and that's the reason I want to make aware of, uh, of that and uh, and ask if there's any objection on that to, to, to studying this work. So um, the idea is that Klaus Hartke is coordinating this kind of work and also uh, other members will contribute to, the, to this contribution. And also it's a call to, to everyone who is also into this, this work to simple, yeah, to join this activity here and um, right. That's it's all, and yeah, I'm open for a question, um, any feedback, et cetera. So what, one thing that struck me when, when I looked at the page is that this was essentially a copy of this file. So maybe you can just pull in that file and you're 95% done. You see what I posted in the chat? Yeah, I will open that. Well, it's an XML file, so um, there are readable versions of that. Yeah, so I think, I think Carson we want is a machine readable version of this data expressed in RDF. And in fact, we actually want to have yeah. a fixed URL for it so we can reference it in a context file in the thing description. Yeah. So I think part of it is simply mechanical. It's simply taking this information you just pointed at and converting it into a a, a, a TTL file that we can we can link to. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or yeah, set of definitions in JSON LD. 
Maybe a couple of lines of XSLT is all that you need. Maybe. Uh, I think we also, though, want to have it available at some fixed URL somewhere. And maybe this is someplace, something that could exist. Uh, where does this go in the web, right? So that's like a little question. So I have some problem to open the link. Ah. Well, it's an Excel file, so uh, the browser may not be able to show it. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the question is, with X, XML, in theory, there should be a way to use a, a XML pointer or something to point a particular thing in here. And that can be the link that we use in, in JSON-LD for each of these concepts, right? Yeah, I mean, this is maybe a very good input. And uh, I mean, to be sh clear, so we don't want to change anything there. Yeah? We want just to bring all the co up uh, as it intended to to be used to also yeah. in, a, in the same meaning there yeah and uh, I was not aware of this this file I'm still struggling here so it may not cover everything but it covers all the things that are growing so you may need a couple more things that, that actually come from the document uh, but all the things like like option space method space, uh, RT values and, and all this stuff um, are uh, being maintained by IANA. So uh, having the, the ability to pull in IANA XML and, and turn this into something like RDF uh, might be something that, that we should be cultivating here in, in Wishy. Yeah, well, if we could automate the process of creating the RDF from this, Absolutely. that would be great. Yes. And again, it's going to be a few lines of XSLT or maybe some saner programming language. I don't know. Well, do we have um, somebody who is willing to volunteer? The to version, yes. Is there somebody willing to do uh, to volunteer to take a stab at prototyping that? Who's well, an XSL expert? I'm not exactly an, an uh, proficient in, in XSLT or RDF, so I cannot volunteer to do that. But uh, maybe somebody else can. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very good idea, and I think I, I, I think the work is actually quite easy. Yeah, it's just yes. I would say someone take uh, some time, and I think we will be finished in maybe in two days. Yeah, and <laughs> I think it's not a uh, <laughs> this is not a, not not a rocket science what we're doing here. Yeah, but if you have already this kind of uh, full list here. Then it helps quite easily to transform this in an RDF representation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only is the full list it's in XML, so it's a structured document internally, right? Yes. So we just need to figure out how to parse it and turn into what we need. And again, XSL can help us pull up the pieces we need. Let me quickly show how the XML looks like. Uh, hello. Computer. Yeah. You can hear you. Yeah, it's, um, what happened it takes to this share, right? Um, so I, I already have some tools that download the core parameters and do stuff with them. So my plan was just to update those tools um, in the usual one afternoon um, and then uh, send the results back to W3C. If anyone wants to help with that, um, please ping me and uh, we can can have a discussion. But I think it's not just a matter of saying it to W3C. I think we want to have, from a user's point of view, is the ability to add a single line to their context and get a bunch of definitions they can use inside a TD. So we actually need to have you know, these definitions posted somewhere on, on, available, right? And yes, and then we need a little bit of glue to put those. Um, dynamically generated um, vocabularies uh, together. Yeah, I think we need to publish, you know, uh, a note or something somewhere or, or an RDFRC explaining how to use the, the, these these terms inside a JSON-LD document. So that's kind of where the protocol binding, so we could do that in W3C, but is it the right place to do it is the other question we have. Uh, since Klaus is already the designated expert for about half of this file, uh, he knows his way 
Yeah, so what, what you're doing right now is the registry for meth codes. So the, the fact that get is a one and post is a two and so on, that's in this registry. And then we have the response codes, which is in this registry mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So that should be pretty easily possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's perfect. It's really yeah. perfect. So I guess so one I question, think, uh, Sebastian, I had, what about OCF? So OCF, OCF uses some extensions, um, some header extensions. Um, do we want to leave that out or, or pull in certain extensions or is there just some general mechanism to easily do those? Oh, they're in here. Hmm. Uh, I, I mean, at the moment, we're just addressing the co-op core as it is, right? Well, yeah, and but if in the INA spec, we're looking at it right now. So if it already exists in the INA, then we should get it for free. Great. Yeah. Yeah. If it's already in there, then we can also cover that. Yeah, so this is option 2053, which Michael Costa uh, registered for the OCF content format version. So that's all in there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, well, we are done. It's out of time. I mean, and, and, and again, I mean, one of the intentions is also to, yeah, if, if there's any objection on that or what we are doing uh, there, please let us know because um, this is um, mainly the W3C is quite important that we're not doing something what you don't like. Yeah, so because co-op is ITF and uh, if you are against this, what we are doing there to have also RDF representation, then I think we have to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> One thing we're well, saying though is that the protocol binding document would be an informative document and would point back to, you know, this probably as the normative mm -hmm. definitions, right? But we're still saying, here's how you will use it inside a TD document. And here's, here's an RDF file that has the same information. So if we can get this that converts the XML into RF, uh, RDF in a form that IANA can use that tool, we could maybe even make sure that IANA is in a position to, to publish this RDF file. I think that, that would be a very good way of handling this. So uh, to run a schedule job on GitHub Actions. Yeah, that, that's the second best, but I think the best uh, solution would be for IANA to own this. I, I think so too. So who, who can contact IANA? Let, let's and have also, the yeah, file and the converter first, and then then discuss with Ayana how we can make this permanent. Yeah, that sounds like it, right? And that would cover like so much more than just core too. Sorry, I have to run, but this sounds like a really good direction. Yeah, I like this idea as well. Yeah. Great. So we're out of time. Uh, please uh, answer the doodle that will be sent to. Uh -huh. the research group mailing list and see you all in six weeks okay vacation yeah then. have a nice vacation bye bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you all have a nice and bye, bye.